Experiment 27 in Chem 1212 is titled Acid Rain, Environmental Reactions of Nitrogen and Sulfur Oxides. The big idea of this experiment is to generate these oxides inside a petri dish, which we're going to use as sort of a mini environmental chamber, and to observe their effects on rainwater. We'll use bromocresol green indicator to observe changes in the acidity or basicity of rainwater upon exposure to these oxides. In the first part of this experiment, we're going to be revisiting pH indicators and looking at the effects of various compounds on the color of the indicator we'll use throughout this lab, bromocresol green. So what we'll do is we'll set up a petri dish with seven drops, six drops along the outside and one in the center. You'll add a drop of bromocresol green to each spot, and then you'll add a particular aqueous solution over top of that. So for A, it's aqueous sulfuric acid, B is just plain rainwater, C, ammonium hydroxide, D, sodium bicarbonate, E, sodium nitrite, F, sodium sulfite, and G, just bromocresol green as a point of reference. And I want you to think about two questions as you're going through this part of the experiment. First of all, what's the acidity of each of these compounds, A through G, relative to B, relative to just plain rainwater? We're going to be evaluating the acidity of rainwater upon exposure to NOx and SOx, and to do that, we need to know what colors represent acidic and basic solutions. So think about the acidity of each of these compounds relative to B. The second thing I want you to think about is whether any acidic or basic gases may be generated by these solutions A through G. And gases is sort of an operative key term there. Because if a gas is generated, then it can diffuse to the other droplets. And you're going to observe a color change in the other droplets that's not necessarily due to the compounds that were there in solution, but to the acidic or basic gas that was generated as a result of something happening in a completely different drop. In the second part of the experiment, we're going to transition to actually generating nitrogen oxides, or NOx, which I've written here as NO and NO2. And specifically, what we're interested in is the effect of drop size, the effect of the size of the drop of rainwater on the diffusion of these gases inside the Petri dish. So you're going to set up a Petri dish in an arrangement something like this, with large, medium size, and small drops radiating outward from a central drop, which I've drawn here, as a red circle. So the black dots here are rainwater plus bromocresol green, which you'll have in a dropper bottle. And the red central dot is an aqueous solution of sodium nitrite to which you'll add a couple of drops of sulfuric acid. And when you do that, as soon as you add the acid, you'll start generating these gases. So it's important to replace the lid as soon as you add that sulfuric acid over top. Here, we're interested in the speed of diffusion of the gases as a function of drop size, with an eye on the idea that raindrops and cloud droplets and fog droplets are different sizes and the diffusion of pollutant gases like NOx through these droplets might be different as a result of their different size. You'll add ammonium hydroxide to that central droplet, and I want you to think about the effect of the added ammonium hydroxide particularly pay close attention to what happens to the colors of the droplets radiating outward after you've added NH4OH. In the third part of the experiment, we'll generate and detect SOx, sulfur oxides. The setup for this part of the experiment is a little bit different. We're still going to be working with a petri dish and lid. In the bottom of the dish, you'll have five droplets, four at the four corners, A, B, C, and D, and then a central droplet where we're actually going to generate SO2. And then on the lid, what you'll do is you'll put a drop of 3% hydrogen peroxide on that lid. And be careful not to let the drop drip down, the purpose being to catch any gases that diffuse on the top of the lid as opposed to the bottom of the Petri dish. So on drop A in the top position, we'll have hydrogen peroxide plus bromocresol green. In position B, we'll have barium chloride, I'll talk about the purpose of that in a second, as well as bromocresol green. In spot C, we'll have barium chloride, hydrogen peroxide, and bromocresol green. And in position D, we'll just have bromocresol green. And again, in position E, we'll have that aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide. To actually generate the SO2, we're going to place an aqueous solution of sodium sulfite in the central drop, and then we're going to add H2SO4 on top of that. 
And again, immediately upon adding the H2SO4, SO2 gas will be generated. So be sure to carefully place the lid on, being sure not to allow that drop E to slide around or drip off the top. Keep in mind here that although we're generating SO2 in the central drop, the hydrogen peroxide in drops A and E serves to oxidize this to SO3. SO3 can in turn be further oxidized to sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, and the purpose of the barium chloride is to detect this sulfate. Barium sulfate is insoluble in water, so if barium and sulfate ions find themselves in the same aqueous solution, barium sulfate will precipitate out. Keeping this idea in mind, here are a couple of questions to think about in this stage of the experiment. First of all, what's the effect on acidity upon the generation of SO2? So here, pay close attention to the color of the bromocresol green in all four droplets, A through D, but particularly in droplet D, where there's nothing else to interfere. In droplet D, we'll know that we have just SO2 because no oxidant is present. In drops A and C, we may have some SO3 and sulfate present. And so see if there are different effects on acidity in the presence and absence of an oxidant. Secondly, look for evidence of that sulfate ion through use of barium chloride as sort of a sulfate ion detector. And look for evidence of SO3 as well. And I'll leave it up to you to think a little bit about how you might detect the presence of SO3. In the final part of the experiment, we're going to generate both NOx and SOx together and observe what happens when both gases are present inside the same environmental chamber. So the Petri dish this time is going to have four drops. I've drawn them here as blue, red, and two black droplets. The blue and the red droplets will be where we generate the NOx and the SOx. So we'll use, as we have been using, the sodium nitrite and the sodium sulfite here with H2SO4 to actually generate the gases. And then A and B we'll use as sort of analytical droplets. And so in drop A we'll have BACL2, and in drop B we'll have starch and Ki. The BACL2, as we've seen already, is just a sulfate detector. If sulfate is present or forms in this droplet, then we'll see BASO4 precipitate out. And the starch Ki mixture serves as an NO2 detector. So you can see the reaction in the lab manual, but NO2 is reduced to NO2 minus, and Ki is oxidized to iodine, I2, which binds tightly to the starch and forms this beautiful blue complex. We're going to start with just one drop each of sodium nitrite and sodium sulfite to keep the concentrations of NOx and SOx relatively low. We'll make some observations and then we'll add two more drops of each to the blue and red droplets to observe what happens when the concentrations of these gases increase substantially. In this part of the experiment, look for evidence of the production of NOx and SOx in the analytical droplets A and B. Additionally, look for the formation of any very fine droplets, which the lab manual refers to as aerosols. Aerosols may form if gases generated inside the chamber react with or bind to water vapor. The very tiny aqueous solutions thus generated look a lot like the condensation you might see on a windshield in winter.